They had no water, but plenty of plums. The seven of them gathered in a tight circle and ate. Four kids, two bats, and a cockroach. Gregor thought they must look like an easy meal and kept a close eye on the jungle. Laksa was so lost in thought, she did not even seem aware of her surroundings. She held an uneaten plum in her hand while she stared fixedly at the skeleton of some large rodent. Laksa, you going to eat that thing? asked Gregor. She snapped back to reality. Why? Do you want it? No, you should eat it, but we can't stay here very long, said Gregor. Luxa nodded and took a bite of the plum, but her face was troubled. I have been thinking of what Rip Red said, about the value of such a destructive weapon. He was right. Having the plague at our command would give the humans total control over the warm bloods. So you think I'm right? You think Naviv started the plague? said Gregor. It still seems impossible to believe, but there is one way we will know for sure, said Luxa. What's that? said Gregor. If... If, during your absence, she has come up with a cure, then you will be right. For the cradle and the cure will be one, and no other cure will exist now that the starshade is gone. There will be no argument left, said Laksa. Aurora said the bats were ready to fly, so they all mounted up. Nike suggested that Gregor sleep on the way back. He lay down with Boots, who soon drifted off, but he could not sleep. In the dark quiet of the tunnels, the battle was beginning to come back to him. He could remember more of it than the time he'd fought the squids, now almost a complete blank. This time, he could call up very... S oh, Helen's waiting. Oh, and Vanessa. Okay. Hi, Helen. Hi, Vanessa. He could remember more of it than the time he'd fought the squids, now almost a complete blank. This time, he could call up very specific, very specific images of his sword as it severed the life of ant after ant. Who were the ants anyway? Not just animals, not just a natural force. Ripper had talked about them as intelligent creatures that had formed a clever battle plan. They, did they all have names? Did they have parents and children and friends? Who exactly had he killed? He could not sort out his feelings. At the time, he had only thought of protecting the star shade. His own life had been at risk as well. Look at what had happened to Hamnet and Frill. But on the battlefield, Gregor had not been fighting for his own life as much as he'd been fighting to save what he'd believed to be the cure. Sometimes you had to fight. Even Hamnet had agreed to that and he must have thought today was one of those times. Gregor had done what he had to do, but still, he felt horrible when he envisioned the twisted bodies of the ants in the field. And even though Gregor had raged, they had not succeeded in saving the starshade. Hamnet had fought too when backed against the wall, but Gregor knew he hadn't wanted to, that he didn't really think it was a solution to anything. Maybe if they had all taken that approach, they could have still deciphered the prophecy, and there wouldn't be all those corpses waiting to be covered by vines. But would the peaceful what would the peaceful alternative have been? It had been too late to think of them, of one, when the ants were marching in on them. A solution would have needed to have been thought up a while ago. And so many parties, the humans, the rats, the ants everyone would have had to agree that it was for the best. All of this was complicated by the fact that if Gregor was correct about Dr. Naviv, the loss of everyone's life today was utterly pointless. Because the thing they'd all gone to battle over, the starshade, had never been the cure at all. The more he thought, the more his mind reeled in confusion. We were right to fight. It was wrong to fight. We had to fight. It was pointless to fight. He simply did not know where he stood, and it made him feel crazy. No wonder Hamnet had run off to the jungle. After several hours of tormenting himself with the events of the day, flickers of light began to appear in the distance. Regalia was just ahead. A squad of four underlanders on bats materialized to block their way. Then they saw Laksa. 
Queen Luxa! burst out one guard in disbelief. You live! Yes, I live, Claudius, said Luxa, and I must have immediate access to the council regarding the cure to the plague. Yes, by all means, stammered Claudius, but there are several checkpoints meant to screen those who would bring the plague into the city. We must bypass them in the interest of time. Believe me, even if I carried the plague, that would pale in importance to the news I bring, said Luxa. Yes, but we have very strict orders, said the guard. Which I overrule now, said Luxa. Clear my passage to the city. It is a direct order for which I take full responsibility. Claudius looked at the other guards in hesitation, then called out, Clear the queen's passage to the city. He flew with them, waving aside any resistance they met. The queen! The queen returns, he cried out, and the underlanders fell aside. As they flew across the city of Regalia, Gregor could see people on the ground pointing up at them and shouting. He guessed they recognized Aurora by her beautiful golden coat and were hoping that Luxa might be on her. As the exhausted bats skidded on their bellies across the high hall, two female guards ran up to help. Get Aurora and Nike to the hospital at once, said Luxa. Both are injured. Is the council in session? Yes, your highness. They have only just reconvened, said one of the women. Then she quickly placed her hand over her mouth as if suppressing some great emotion. Oh, Luxa, you are back. It is good to see you too, Miranda, said Luxa with a half smile. We must make haste, Gregor. She took Hazard by the hand and headed off. Gregor scooped up his drowsy little sister and he and Temp followed Luxa through the hallways to the council room. The full council was there, including Sullivan and Vicus and Nerissa, who presided at the head of the big stone table. Dr. Naviv was in the process of addressing them. Before her sat a large square rack that held hundreds of glass vials filled with an orange liquid. When the five of them walked in, Naviv stopped speaking mid-sentence and a gasp went up around the table. People were rising, starting to move toward them, but Luxa raised her hand. Please, I have a matter of great urgency that takes precedent over my own happenings. Sit and let me speak, she called. Confused, everyone returned to their seats. Still holding Hazard's hand, Luxa crossed to the table directly across from Dr. Naviv. We have been to the Vineyard of Eyes and found the Starshade. The entire field was destroyed by an army of cutters. The cure is lost, said Luxa. What say you to this, Dr. Naviv? It is tragic news indeed, but we have been working night and day in the labs to try and create a cure of our own. These vials you see before me are the fruit of our labors, said Naviv, gesturing to the glass vials. Luxa looked down at the vials for a moment then took a deep breath before her next question. And have they been tried on the plague victims yet? The patients in the hospital are responding favorably. Both the Overlander's mother and his bond have shown improvement, said Naviv. Gregor's, Gregor felt his knees go weak with relief, right? Because, like, his mom is still alive and so is Eris. Oh, the sound came out of him on its own. They were alive. Somehow they had hung on. Naviv gave him a smile. Yes, we have much hope that this remedy may be effective. There were murmurs of approval and appreciation around the table. The cure was working. Naviv was a hero. Lux's voice cut through the others like a knife. That's a simile like you're studying with Mrs. Lowe. I expect it will be highly effective. I expect it will cure the plague. I hope we may deserve your confidence, said Naviv, but she gave Luxa a nervous look. Oh, I think we both may be confident. Certainly, you look well enough, said Luxa. And if the cure works for you, why should it not work for the rest of us? Naviv flushed bright pink. I do not know what you mean. I mean that you started the plague in your lab. That was the cradle. So it makes sense that the cure came from it as well, said Luxa. There were exclamations and objections from around the table, but Luxa forged ahead. 
Do you deny, Dr. Naviv, that Eris was infected in your lab while you were breeding the plague germ? said Laksa. Now the color drained from Naviv's face, leaving her as pale as a ghost. Another simile. I, I did not. Was he or was he not infected in your lab? insisted Laksa. There was an accident. It was no one's fault, said Naviv. He was there for something else entirely. And you led others to believe that the cure was in the vineyard of eyes, all the time knowing that you had it in your hands, continued Laksa. I could not reveal that. The research was secret and, said Naviv, so to conceal that secret, you let it spread and kill and sent an unsuspecting party on a deadly fool's errand. Is that it? said Laksa. Now Naviv was wildly looking around the room. I was told to study the plague. My assignment was to find an antidote so that we could use it as a weapon. I was only doing what I had been told to do, Naviv cried out. Most of the council members looked stunned, like they'd never heard that. But Gregor couldn't help notice a few faces that reflected Naviv's fear. Some of them knew, Gregor thought. Some of them knew exactly what was going on. Vickis rose shakily from the table and nodded to a pair of guards. Take Dr. Naviv into custody and alert the tribunal that their services will be needed. Guards took Naviv by the arms. She did not even put up any resistance. I was only following orders, she said softly as they led her away. Contact the lab to find out how many doses of the cure they have and have these and take these down to the hospital immediately, said Vickis, indicating the vials of orange liquid. No, said Laksa, her face as hard as flint, which is a stone. My gosh, think of all the similes in, um, where we have in here. Our first act will be to send aid to the Nars. I gave Riprid my word and it will be done. No one in the room dared to object.